Hello everyone and welcome to another Roundtable with Russell and Matthew. We are going to be talking about Scripto and the Radix engine and going into some of the more details of why it's so awesome. So, let's start off with Russell. What is Scripto and the Radix engine? I'm going to flip that. We'll okay. talk about the Radix engine first. Okay. And the Radix engine is a... It's the execution engine for, yeah. you know, how do we actually process a transaction? What's the, the, the steps of calculating the output and all that? But it's more than that. It's also the place where we define these really powerful, these system primitives, like right. fungibles and non-fungibles and these access controls. And then Scripto is a programming language that gives the developer access to all these powerful primitives in the Radix engine and also the general programming expectations you have for any language. From the developer's perspective, this isn't something they have to conscientiously, like, they don't think about differentiating this. Right. You just program in Scripto and the Radix engine provides some nice things that you right. look into. And, and, and so we talk about Scripto uh, and the Radix engine together. Like, what do I, to get started with Scripto, like what do I have to understand about the Radix engine? I'm really not a thing other than the fact that if you're looking for, say, I want to have rules on something or I want to have right. tokens, right. that's provided by the engine. But in fact, since Scripto has these, we have these, these powerful objects already in there that do that, you may not even be aware that's being provided by the engine. So I, the correct answer, I suppose, is nothing. Nothing. Okay. Yeah, it's if, if you want to understand why building things in Scripto is so easy and, and, and direct, then we need to talk about Radix Engine because Radix Engine makes that possible. Right. But really, from the developer who just wants to get something done, Scripto is amazing. But you can't simply up. It's not a. It's not something you can just pick up and drop onto another engine. Right. It depends on Radix Engine to, to to do its work. Okay. Okay. And for people who really care about definitions of things, <laughs> like what is what is Scripto? Like what? Like what's sure. the nuts and bolts of Scripto? Sure. I mean, at, at its heart. Scripto, it's based on Rust. We add some extensions to the compiler to do new things. We have some additional things that we build in so that you can call things in the Radix engine. And we also strip away some things that are non-deterministic, like floating point numbers. Right. So to, um, this was one of the things that we were, we were saying, hey, do we call it a language or do we not? Because really, if you can program Rust, you can program Scripto. You right. get to learn some new things. It really is more than just, oh, it, it's Rust. Well, a lot of the concepts apply, but you'll find when you actually program in it, you're living in those things that are specific to Scripto, specific right. to the Radix engine, right. almost the entire time. Right. Mm -hmm. So it really does from a, a, a perspective of, um, like, what's the best way to communicate it is, it is a language. It is a language. And like, Rust does actually have some really interesting tools for being able to create your own mm -hmm. languages within it, right? Like Rust, some of the things that are in Rust are around domains, building domain-specific languages and stuff like that. Well, it's part of this whole tool chain called the LLVM tool right. chain, which we will absolutely not get into here. <laughs> but you can think of it as it's one of the things where um, at, at the top of the stack, like what right. can I build in? I can compile down to various different targets. Right. In our particular case, Scripto, you write, compiles down to WASM, WebAssembly. Right. And WebAssembly, along with some, um, I guess you could say it's data about, the, say, the blueprint you're going to deploy, the package you're going to deploy, that's what actually gets put onto the ledger. Right. So that means, I suppose, that because it compiles down to WASM and it uses the Radix engine like power, that it is foreseeable that you could use that you, you could have different programming languages other than Scripto. Sure. Right. So yeah. like it's not it's not Scripto is the thing that we have taken the time to work out the best user case use use case for it. Does it like a lot of people talk about Rust? As, a, as quite a hard language to learn. It's quite a picky who, language. Who have you been talking to? <laughs> I mean, it is the most loved language in the it world. It is the most loved. It is the most loved language in the world. But it does have one of those, it does want to have one of those like steep learning curves associated with it. I think it depends I mean, I think where you people, come from. Yeah, I think people have this perception because it's, it's, it's fairly unique in language that you can go very deep into it. Like right. it is capable of replacing languages that were typically designed for like deep embedded systems right. and memory management, that kind right. of stuff. But also it's capable of being used at a very, very high level. Right. And so in Scripto, we're not using the, 
the really deep aspects right. of it. But generally, like the high level syntax we found is actually exceptionally yeah. easy to pick up. Right. And, and, and I suppose people's first languages pick it up, competition winners right. of our challenges right. pick it up in a couple weeks' time. So it, how hard can it be? Well, this yeah. is what I'm getting to is I suppose like Scripto itself is actually pretty easy to pick up. Yes. Right. And, and the parts you'll interact with, we've thought very hard right. about how to make them. How would you intuitively imagine this would work? Start typing in Scripto and your autocomplete will go, oh, good, that's exact, that's available for me right, right there. Right. Yeah, you don't have to right. be worried about like, I need to become a deep Rust expert before you can produce Scripto. We're, right, yeah, we, yeah. And, and I suppose this is the difference that, that often, this is the nuance that sometimes get lost where you, you'd be like, oh, it's Rust based. So like, oh, but so are other layer one right. protocols right. you can build in Rust. And like the difference between building in Rust on something like Near versus the difference in building in Scripto is, is day and night. Yeah, like, absolutely different, yeah. Right. Yeah. You, and, you, would, and, and, and you wouldn't even recognize the two things right. trying to implement the same. You wouldn't see that this was the same code. Right, and a lot of this comes down to the Radix engine, right? Yes. So like, how can I think about, like, what, what is the handoff between, from a developer point of view, like, how, what is the handoff between the two? So from the developer point of view, if you're staying at, I'm writing code, yeah. there is none that you right, think right, about. Right. When it's actually at executing, when the, the WASM that's on the ledger is being interpreted, basically you get to a point where it says, oh, I'd like to uh, mint a new token, right. something like that. This then goes into a system call to the kernel, which is all within the Radix, and it says, ah, the code wants to mint a new token. Let's go into rule check mode and find out if this is an okay thing to do. And if so, you know, we're gonna turn back, hey, it was created and here's the, the associated information with that. Or we could say, nope, error and the whole thing will panic. Right, right. The way I kind of like thinking of that, about this is, is that a, a virtual machine in general, where it's the EVM on Ethereum or Radix engine on Radix, you can think of it kind of as the hardware. You can think of it basically as a big distributed computer. Like Ethereum likes talking about the world computer. It's a pretty good metaphor. Right. It really is something where in sum, as a developer, you can just see this as a computer that you can run some code on. Right. But as it turns out, it's not as like it's not like everyone's using the same basic hardware configuration, right. or at least we aren't. We have chosen right. to do a very different hardware configuration from what everyone else pretty much is using, um, and so we have additional features that we've built in. It's kind of like, you know, having a graphics card that you've you've loaded into your computer. You have something that's really specifically designed for rendering very large number of triangles to render scenes in games. Well, if you have that you need to write special code to, to access that piece of hardware. Right. And that code makes no sense if you don't have that piece right. of hardware. So we've, we've basically have, we've extended the virtual machine to include the notion of assets. Right. And you actually end up spending most of your time interacting with that part of the hardware. Right. The rest of the hardware is still there. You can write general purpose right. code and there's, it's still right. Turing complete and all those wonderful right. things. But you're, you're gonna spend most of your time in DeFi manipulating assets, which is the bit that we've added is the assets part. Right. Right, so the, um, and, and just to be clear, you're not talking about the Radix ledger itself nodes needing specific hardware, you're talking about right. this I'm using it as a metaphor, yeah, yeah. An analogy yeah, yeah. that, that you, right. you, can, you can use to, to imagine uh, like hardware accelerated processes within computers or something right. like that. Um, we talk a lot about sort of assets and resources and like native assets within the Radix engine. Could you explain a little bit more about why those are important for Web3 and DeFi? Yeah. And, and this is, this was core to our thinking for a very right. long time. It says, hey, tokenizing stuff and doing interesting things with those tokens is why so many industries are, industries are seeing that like DLT is the next big thing. Distributed right. public ledgers are going to be huge because of tokenization. Right. And if all the interesting stuff being done is reliant upon tokens, really should bake that into the platform at every level. So right. it's, it's part of the absolute fabric of the platform. It is a native concept. There is no, um, no part of the stack that doesn't understand what an asset is. Okay, and, and, and how does that end up um, sort of manifesting for, for the point of view of the developer? And from the developer, it's that the stuff you do most often, which is I want to create an asset with the following characteristics and I want to you know, move it here or securely store it here. All those actions are guaranteed and predictable. Right. And the way the approach we took for this is we said this is so important, we'll uh, use a finite state machine approach right. for this. We're going to do, this is, this is the thing you see in like, traffic lights, for example. Right. It'd be really bad if there was a green light in these two directions at the same time. So it's designed so that is absolutely impossible. It cannot happen. Right. Right. Other 
finite state machines appear a lot in important industrial controls and right. that sort of thing. So right. we said, let's do the same thing for native assets, right. for resources as we call right. them, which is to say, look, we have these different states they can be in. For example, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's in existence, it's, it's, in, it's stored in this component. Now it's in flight somewhere because it's being passed between things. And now I, I want to destroy it, so it's gonna be burned, it's gonna go out of existence. Right. All these things are state transitions and all of these state transitions, we can say, this is a place where you can put rules on when that state transition is allowed. Right. And we give the developer the control over those rules. So you can say, look, here's a token. There's these knobs on, that you can turn on and on. This is when minting is allowed. This is when burning is allowed. Right. This is when um, someone can, can uh, some authority could pull it out of someone's wallet and reclaim it, that sort of thing. We make this very easy to interact with and the rules you set can be as powerful as you want. It could be, oh, you just have to have this single thing mm -hmm. or it's this complex multi-level multi-sig thing. There's as powerful as you want it to be. And most importantly, because we've defined, this is exactly how assets operate. Right. These are the state transitions and these are the rules around them set by the developer. We can expose that to higher layers. So wallets can say, ah, I see this token, whether you already receive it or you're getting it in a manifest and you're deciding, do I want Squid Game coin? This, I like Squid Game, I'm gonna get Squid Game coin, right? It can show right there, hey, by the way, there's this recall ability that if anybody has this badge, they can pull the token out of your wallet. Now, in the case of this Squid Game coin, you go, that doesn't sound right. This wasn't being sold to me as something that someone could just yank away from me. So go do your, your investigation. We've now warned you to, hey, maybe go check this out before you engage with this thing. Right. Or maybe someone can freeze it there's a setting here where someone can say, under certain circumstances, this could be made so you couldn't withdraw it right. from, your, from your account unless you were to present this appropriate authority. Right. Maybe that's correct, but maybe that's something you're not expecting. Right. So it's, we can make it, it's, it's back to this no surprises thing that we try to right. get everything. If we could say right. the developer gets powerful controls and the user is, a, is aware of the choices they made. But how does that relate to sort of speed of development? I mean, how much time are you saved to just if the main thing you're doing is moving assets around, right. and the main thing that all the hacks that are occurring, one of the, the largest ones is just all around this, oh, that asset wasn't implemented correctly, there is some backdoor into the contract, that, that all just goes away. You just right. say, I want a fungible, or I want a non-fungible with the following you know, data schema to it for what right. I put in. It just lifts that entire coding burden away from you, and it's not just the, the thinking about how to do it, it's also that safety is also guaranteed for you. Right. You don't have to go prove out, is my token transfer thing safe? Of course it's safe. Right. It's completely built in. Right. So does that, does that you, I suppose you're getting rid of a lot of boilerplate, mm -hmm. but you're also giving a lot of like assurances about execution as well. And I can deal with things I wasn't aware of right. at the start. I can be... If I know how to enter, like, hey, you can give me any fungible token, right. it doesn't matter if at some point down the line someone, let's take the example of um, um, you know, a token that's, that they come with one. Oh, and these certain rules we could freeze or unfreeze right. the supply. Yep. Like a stable coin. Uh, most most se centralized stable coins like Tether, you can do that. Right. And let's say you wrote your, your application without ever having that as a notion. Right. You could still accept those tokens when someone comes in and deploys them. They're still just a standard fungible token. Yeah. It's just they have these additional rules. Now, right. somebody who interacted with your system and that token became frozen, that say pool you had for swapping would be effectively useless until the freeze ended right. or until someone was able to say, oh no, I have the authority to allow withdrawals. That can be passed down to the component. But you as the developer of say that RataSwap pool, you never had to think about that. Right. You just said a token's a token to me. Right, right. I, yeah, I think an important aspect of the speed of development part is how much more direct it is from how you conceptualize what you're building to the code you're writing in that you know, it's, it's one of these things that's best done by example. This is why like one of the first things we do is test out the syntax and people were immediately going, oh, I get it. Like developers right. latched right. onto it really quickly. When you're trying to describe it, it's like examples are the best way of conveying it. Like, you know, comparing to the alternative, if assets are this collection of smart contracts that are out somewhere on the network, when you want to interact with an ass asset, what you have to do is right logic around going out and interacting with these things, being careful about what it can and can't do, 
making these method calls, making sure the results come back. It's sort of this like balance management system. It feels like an integrating to a bank system. It's sort right. of like, what's going on over there? Okay, I'm gonna check it at my system, sort of logic, like that's a very complex thing to do. Whereas what you, when you imagine the application, when you were first whiteboarding it with your, with the, you know, the, the, the guy that came up with the idea and you're trying to implement it and you're brainstorming ideas, you probably drew out this system where it's like, all right, here's our system and there's like this bucket of tokens that's coming in here. We're gonna take that bucket of tokens and we're gonna put it in here and then we're gonna run this, this equation on it and then we're gonna pass something else back. Right, right, right. And then today what happens is then you have to like take that idea, break it all down, go like, all right, how do we sort of create that behavior when we're interacting with all these different smart contracts? Whereas with us, we literally have the notion of a bucket. This is something we did because it was a nice, easy to understand thing. It's like, we have the idea of an asset can just be passed to your component. Right. Not a reference to the component, right. not a number that you then look up in a smart contract. Right. It literally is the asset because the platform itself understands that. When you, if I take all the tokens out of a bucket right. and then I pass it to someone else and they try to take tokens of the bucket, right. the platform goes, uh-uh, there right. are no tokens in the bucket. Right. So you can't do that unless the platform itself understands this stuff. And this is where the idea of like making digital assets feel like physical objects, right? Right. And it also goes into this idea of narrowly describing what it is that you want a smart contract to do with which assets. Like right now, right. on any other platform, when you're interacting with a with a with a smart contract based DeFi application, you're basically saying, I give you default permission at ad infinite forever where you can manage in my balances mm -hmm. whereas in this model because because the net assets are baked asset, asset behavior is baked into the platform and you you're going okay i'm going to fill this bucket with only the assets i want you to manipulate mm -hmm. and i am going to hand those, that bucket across to you with specific instructions of what you can or cannot do or do with it and then if anything fails or anything like that then the system just deals with that. You, right. As a developer, you don't have to go, what's the exception case? What happens if failure case? If, if they forget to say, you know, what, what if at the end of the transaction, there's some tokens left in a bucket, they weren't put back into a vault in a component, the system goes, oh, that's, that's an impossible state transition. You just tried to effectively, they went out of scope there, they weren't burned, they right. just vanished. We don't allow right. that. System catches that, and even though the developer may not have been malicious, just careless, right. you're safe. Right. right. Cause the, the physical description of an asset is someone has to own this at any given point in time. So if your logic doesn't resolve that, it doesn't say, well, you've got these assets, you got to put them somewhere. It just says this is an invalid thing you're trying to do. So like from the point of view of um, development time, I think that one of the things that people often don't realize when you're building critical systems or financial systems, that, that often the, the majority of your time is is, is dealing with, if not security, but exception handling as mm. well. And so a lot of this is now coming for free or, or sort of mm -hmm. implied. And that goes all the way down to, I've heard you say this a couple of times, Russell, um, around this idea of compilation. Like if, if the scripto compiles, that's a pretty good, that you're pretty close to a, a well-functioning system. Could you just talk a little bit about that? This is, actually we've heard this from a few people. Right. It depends on the level of complexity you're at, right. of course. There, this, this, this will break down if you have a vastly complicated system. But, and this is part of the benefits of Rust. Um, the model of ownership in Rust is, is a very powerful one that applies very well and lets you, if you've made some kind of inadvertent silly mistake where you've passed the wrong thing or you haven't properly transferred ownership of something, that the compiler will warn you about it and it won't right. even start. So especially for something, like if you think of DeFi products today, like Uniswap level complexity, I guarantee you when you're building these things, as soon as it compiles, you will already in your head go, this is going to work. I'm going to go test it, but I know it's going to work. And if it didn't work on the first try, it'll just be some very, oh yeah, I forgot, you know, then comes to a bit of the, all right, now let's think through the edge cases. But if I want to get hello world working for my DeFi app, yes, once it's compiling in script does it, you're, you're there. Yeah, and it applies to like, all different types of asset manipulation, moving things in and out of vaults, but even like the authorization stuff that we do with Radix Engine, where you'll find that the the, the compiler will catch this. You're trying to do something, and it kind of goes, you know, you're saying that you're presenting a badge to this thing, right. but you haven't actually like that. You're not actually presenting that thing, so I'm not even going to try to run this. It's not a matter of 
bug handling. It's just you've made a conceptual error here, right? Because it understands what the concept of what these things, how these things should be relating right. to each other. I think this was the, the genesis of, of one one guy making the comment that it felt like Braddock's engine has your back. Right. That was his first experience with it. He was like, oh, this is cool. It feels like it's kind of like shepherding me in the direction of understanding, like, wait, I, I, you're saying you want to do this, but actually it doesn't make sense, right? Right. And you find the compiler isn't, it's not the kind of compiler, or the, you know, the bug finding experience where you're kind of going, damn it, just get this thing to run. Like, why is it getting into my way? You feel like it's helping you. It's feeling like, oh yeah, that didn't make sense the way I was, I was writing it that way. And so by the time you, you get something that actually runs, it actually conceptually makes sense. Right. Now you could have still made an error in sort of, it's, it's reasonable business logic, but you've right. done something silly, but that's right. not really a bug at that point. Right, right, right. And, 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 and like, just, just cha a challenge for you on the FSM based system, right? Finite state machine means that there is a finite set of states. Mm -hmm. So why is that not a problem for the universe of possible tokens that people could create? How are we so sure that, it, that, that, that we've described sufficiently all of the type of innovations or the majority type of innovations that people are gonna make, wanna make with tokens and NFTs and all these kind of things if there are a baked in set of finite states that the, 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 the Radix mm -hmm. engine will support for those asset types? And for the states themselves, we are sure, basically you could be in existence, you could be temporarily held or permanently held. It's what are those rule sets, right. the, the things you can control, are we sure right. of that? Right. We feel very good in that we have asked over and over again, give us use cases. And we have had many times someone says, this is impossible. And we say, actually, there is a way to do that, right? We, it, sometimes it takes a little bit of adjusting of your head. And the, the big, the mental switch for everyone is, right. Build your interesting logic into your scripto component. Not the asset itself should not be the thing where there's all the smarts to it. Right. Limit that to certain things like, okay, well, I, I don't want it to be withdrawable or I don't right. want it to be recallable. That sort of right. thing. That makes sense to have that as baked into the asset. Right. But all these incredible innovations you could design, that's all put that in the business logic right. that operates on the asset. Right. And this is a big shift for anyone that has been on anything that is ERC-20 style, where you're, you're, you have this contract that not only defines the balance sheet of the token, but all the special behavior. Right. And they're so um, like conditioned it. to this behavior of, you bake all the logic into the token itself. That's right. the Uniswap, the LP token right. contract, right. is actually the pool. Right. That's bananas, <laughs> right. but that's how it has to be. Right. Right. The, the CryptoKitties right. NFT is the CryptoKitties game. Yeah. Like right. it's, it's crazy. Right, and I always think of the the um, example that was sort of like one that we went around a bit on was like, how do you have royalties on NFTs? And mm -hmm. it's like, well, what you have is you have the NFT, and then you have a, a, a a rule with that NFT on a piece of business logic that says if this if this badge isn't present, then the transfer can't occur. But getting mm -hmm. the badge is just paying the royalty. Right. And to, you can set it up that way. And you can say and then and then every time you transfer it, the royalty has to has has to go with the NFT. So you can it, and Matt's concept that he he's talked about for the longest time that I think is so helpful is this idea of business objects and actions, right? Like you've got these business objects that we care about, we can define them within a relatively you know, wide universe of possible objects, but still a finite set of possible objects. And then the business actions, the logic around it can be infinite. Mm -hmm. Right, and, this is one of these laws of physics things that yeah. we, you know, we were trying to define, like we were trying to think of use cases, like what are all the things people wanna do with tokens? And can you distill this down to a finite state machine that makes sense? Like what right. is that minimum thing that we bake into the finite state machine versus what do we consider business logic? Right. And the funny thing was that this ended up not being an arbitrary choice. It wasn't, this isn't something we're like, all right, we're starting with this set of features and then we're gonna add something else to the finite state machine to do a soul bound token. And we're gonna add something else to do this next thing. Right. What, we've, what we discovered was that if you're just thinking of this, at, like assets are actually simple things in the end. If you, right. anything that you would ever call an asset has a very limited number of things that it ever does. Right. An asset is something that it came into existence according to some sort of rule. Yeah. It can be destroyed according to some set of rules. Maybe. It, it goes, yeah, maybe, exactly. Some things don't, some things are, like cannot actually be destroyed. Some right. things, right. Some things cannot be created. There are, it is, it transfers from one place to another. Like I, ha I own it, it is transferred to someone else. It basically has this very simple thing, set of, of, of state transitions, you call right. them, basically a very small thing that is physical. It's just think of it as a, we often use it like the, the most simple asset is a pile of rocks. 
And so if you want to, if you start with a pile of rocks, the difference between a pile of rocks and a tokenized security isn't as much as you might think. Right. It's basically just a pile of rocks, but there's a legal authority that says it can only transfer to someone that has certain right. you know, rights to be able license. to license. Right, exactly. Yeah, to, right. To hold a rock, you must be licensed. So right. the interesting thing about this laws of physics thing is every time we go through these use cases from a community, what we usually discover is that the crypto solution to this models something that exists in the real world. Right. It feels natural. You find out like, oh yeah, that's, you know, if you want to charge a royalty for transferring something, there's probably a royalty collection system, right. which has some authority about how things move from place right. to place. And you right. got to pay it in order right. to do that thing. Right. So it ends up like, this is why we feel really good that we've, we've, We've happened to cross something, cross something that isn't limiting. Right. It's just modeling the expectation that all human beings have for what an asset is. Yeah. I, it's interesting because obviously, like, this is not, Radix is not the only platform that claims to have native assets. Right. So, like, how do you compare the Radix concept of native assets and resources to sort of other layer one's approaches to native assets? radically better <laughs> this is this is one that i get there are a few things that, that get me that get me like a little heated but it's when i see you know those those feature comparison things yes. and like oh native assets for x platform and yeah. there's a tick box there's a right. tick mark there i go no absolutely not you you have a head fake towards native assets we have native it's assets like native Assets. But like, how do, how, like, how okay. do you explain that? So, to give a little more for the folks at home, <laughs> after I've had my rant, you have, I mean, the, the majority of them, you have basically some, something that equivalently is like a platform-endorsed ERC-20 contract, right. which says you don't have to deploy your own. We've, right. we've figured out how to do send, mint, burn, right. et cetera, right. balance update. Right. And, and that, that's baked in. It's native. And if you want one, you just ask for one and you get right. one. Obviously, that's still very siloed. It doesn't shard the way we do and all that. And it's still, you're still doing that. You're sending to a part of the system saying, oh, please make this happen on my behalf. It's still not, I'm not directly controlling my assets. Right. You have ones that have gone like another step on where it's, oh, well, tokens are special. You know what we should have? They can't be accidentally destroyed. They can't be accidentally copied. Right. Cool. You've made a small incremental improvement. Right. right? You have nowhere near what we have where it's just every part of the system understands this. They're part of, you can put them in transactions directly. You can, in the wallet, you can understand what it is you're looking at. They mm -hmm. actually live in your account. All these things are a true native implementation. And the best way to, to understand it is to try to program Uniswap right. in other places. Right and just see how it feels. Do you feel like you're really pushing around native tokens? Is that your feeling? I guarantee you, when you come to the end, you've done it in script, you go, yep, that was the one, that was a native token. We have some things that, oh, you've made an approximation of it, but it doesn't feel quite right. Right, right. it doesn't actually just baking an ERC-20 into the platform, doesn't give you the performance benefits. It doesn't change how you program around those assets. Right. It doesn't change the wallet model, of what it can show you and how extensible it is. Like right. the only problem it solves is, it's easier to make a token. Right. It, it, fewer it. lines of code to create token. Right. Congratulations. And, but it's not like, I think that what's really important to understand about this is that we talked about native assets, but it's actually native accounts, native assets, native and, and like, and these concepts like badges, right. which allow authorities and permissions and all of that kind of stuff together mm -hmm. is kind of what's necessary to be able to describe the kind of applications that you actually see in DeFi in a way that feels like you're dealing with physical objects that have your back, that are actually safe, that you can be sure about the predictable nature of their behavior. Right, mm -hmm. this is another, we, we talked in the Cerberus video about how we ended up, there were many conversations where we were moving up and down the stack to find the solution. And this is very much another one of those things where, right. where we, the idea, the, the, the initial prototypical idea of at native assets was actually in the very first form of Radix right. engine, not the latest one. It was like yeah, yeah, yeah. on the current Olympia network, it already has native assets, right. they're just, very, very simple. Right. Um, and and they, they, they don't have the authorization, all the stuff that we're adding on right. to it. But it was one of the first things we realized we needed. Right. Because we continually have these conversations moving up the stack where it's like, well, we have to have that because otherwise it's not shardable. And we have to have that. Otherwise, we can't do things like intent-based transactions and we can't do a better de developer experience. So it's, it's, a, it's a deep, deep choice in the platform, not just a sort of like, all right, we're dropping some tokens on top of the stack. No, I mean... It, this also relates to the question, like, we say a lot 
that Scripto and the Radix engine helps reduce hacks and exploits. And like, could you give us a bit more of a flavor of like how you're backing that up? How that's actually, why that's actually the mm -hmm. case? And this, this is a tough one to communicate because of course, the marketing message you want to boil down to is like, no hacks. You know? right. Then of course, any properly skeptical person says, no hacks. Right. Right. Sounds like nonsense to me. I dismiss whatever else you say. Right. So let's, let's <laughs> dig into that a little bit. Yeah. So you can, if you want to think about hacks on distributed ledgers, there are about three, call it three categories that they, 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 they broadly break into. Yeah. The first one is, um, and, and not just hacks, but attacks. That can also be social right. engineering and the like. Right. The first one is you, you trick someone into signing something that they ought not have. It right. did something that they didn't expect. Or you um, got them to give, to delegate permissions to right. more than was required, which maybe because of gas fees, they said, I don't want to do the minimum permissions. So I don't want to pay a fee every time to right. do this, right? Um, so that's one, and then you can make up with some money from those things. Two is you have hacks where it's like the, the mechanics, the operations that were involved were so complicated that it was very difficult to reason about. And so it was hard to foresee that this could occur. Right. Right. This is um, certainly a, a large part of the attacks that existed there. Just like it, it, was, it was too complicated for even a well-meaning developer to foresee that this could occur. Right. And then the third, the third category is more of the kind you get in you know, non-DLT systems, which is basically you didn't think through all your, your business logic right. correctly. Right. Like you, you had a, a garden variety bug of, oh, wow, didn't think of that. Right. That was, uh, you know, that was obvious that my system could be interacted with in that right. way, but I, I failed to consider that edge case, right? right? So let's, let's park number three for a minute and then go into the other one. So the first one, that tricking someone to sign stuff or this delegating of permissions, that one we've resolved. We have this, that, that entire notion of you can see what it is you're signing, you place your guarantees on it. As long as um, the user is willing to look at their wallet screen before they click sign and they just blindly you know, mash their finger while their secretary is shoving transactions in front of them or whatever it is, that part's solved. There's no delegating of permissions whatsoever. We don't, right. you don't say, oh, you can spend on my behalf. We don't do that. You right. pull the tokens out of your account and you go send them where you want. Right. So that's solved. So, one, I can say that, that that's solved for, for a reasonable definition of solved. So two is that it's difficult to reason about stuff. Right. Some of those things, we've done a lot of studying of other platforms, and we have solved some of those things. Like reentrancy mm. is an area that has caused a lot of money to be lost. Right. And it is one of those, it's hard to reason about right. it. After you get um, in a mental space of exactly how it works, say in the EVM, it doesn't threaten you anymore, but it's not easy to understand right. all the, the how to prevent against right. it. And that, that was literally what the DAO hack was. The original DAO hack was and, the reentry. And, and many attack. others. And many others. Even since. after it was a known problem, right. it's easy to fail to stop this or to not stop it all the way. Right. So we said, look, no reentrancy. We can solve that through other means right. for places that would normally need it. Right. So we can enable all of the functionality of reentrancy right. without actually allowing reentrancy right. in code. We have this concept of a what we call a transient token, mm. going back to our powerful native assets, mm. which is a token that can never be deposited under any circumstances. <laughs> and I remember I said that, look, if a token has just been sitting in a bucket at the end of the transaction, the transaction fails because it wasn't right. safely put into a vault in right. a component for permanent right. storage. So, well, how does a transaction not fail every time? Uh, it is burnable, right. and you control who has the burn authority. Right. So I have something like a flash loan. I can say, look, how much money you want? Give me a million XRD. Here's your million XRD, and here's a, trans here's a transient token too, buddy. Right. And the only thing that has the ability to burn that transient token is say some other method in my flash that says, give me my money plus right. my interest, right. right? This doesn't have to be the same component. It could be I might have like an ecosystem where I have, I have an Oracle that will give you price information for free as long as you're willing to go use my exchange right. on the back half of the transit. Right, right. The exchange will burn that Oracle promise, that right. transient token. Right, right? Right. So this lets you do what you were, what you, the reason you wanted reentrancy without right. requiring. It's basically one-time permission, but using the underlying. So you, you must come back to me right. later. Right. And, and you do what you want in the meantime. Right, right. Like, I think this is a really interesting class of bug or, or security problem or whatever you want to call it, like problem for developers, because it, 
it is such an important one, but it's really hard to explain how important it is. It's not something you can solve with formal analysis of your code or anything like that. It's, it's, and it's, I think it's a really central part of why Radix Engine and Scripto are powerful because it allows you, you know, like the thing you talk about, the transient token, like what's important about that is that as a developer, I can imagine that. Right. It's something I can, I can build that mental model in my head. Right. It's like, oh, that's cool. I hand out the money, but I also put this little voucher thing on it and I got to get that back before I'm going to be willing to right. handle it. Has it has to come back, otherwise the transaction is void. Right, right. And, right. You, and as long as you like, as long as your mental model matches how the system actually works, which right. is exactly what assets are all about, right. then that will work and you can rely on. Right. And what the, this, this drastically simplifies the code and allows you to, like anytime you're building something, you need to build this mental model of what it's supposed to do, write the code to do it, and you kind of start modularizing it right. so that you really, you, it's like, I understand how this part works, this is very, I can rely on this, now I can build another part and I know how those two things okay. interact. Yeah. The problem is that like the minimum unit of functionality on every other platform is insanely complex. <laughs> if you're doing like even something very, you know, we always use the example of Uniswap. Like Uniswap right. is conceptually dead simple. Right. It's just token goes in, little math, token goes back. Right. If you can't mentally model that and write something very, very rapidly, this is a broken programming model. Right. And it's just, you're asking for bugs because anything even a little bit more complex than that the, the complexity multiplies and there's no way that you're going to be able to fit it in your head at the same time. Right. And if you can't do that, even the skilled developer is always going to miss things. Right, right. So this goes to your sort of reasoning, your oh, yes. section two of your... So, so the, the, the difficult to reason, so re-entrancy, disable, because too yeah. many problems associated right. with it and we can, we can achieve it through other means. Right. Right. The other one that's caused so much grief for the developer is that how do I get admin access on this thing where I have right. single signers? Like, well, right. your caller, it's all based on the caller. Like, who's calling me? That's, and, and, and all the admin flows that flow from that, this is really, really easy to, especially when you have these different things with external calls and different components, right. it's really easy to get wrong. It's caused a, a, with, with, if you include bridge attacks, it's certainly billions of dollars right. have been lost to right. this. Right. This is not, this is not like people didn't weren't aware this was a was an right. important thing to get right. They right. thought about it a lot. Right. They had multiple code audits, right. and it's still something slipped right. through. Yeah. So we said again, callers got to go. Let's have a hold. The permissions and roles are really important yep. to important systems. Yep. Let's make a whole system for that. And we came up with this concept of badges, which uses our native assets, where you can say, look, to get into this method or to perform this state transition on an asset you have to meet the following rule. Right. And I can build this custom rule from, oh, you just need to present a proof of this right. one thing, or I need two out of these things, or quantity 100 of this. It could be as powerful as you want. The important thing is, the way you think of it in your head is exactly the way you do it in the system. Right. And the, the, the kernel is providing the security right. for you. It is making sure, hey, you said for this state transition, this has, has to be, be there. Badge, yeah. You don't have to remember it. Right. If it tries to happen without that, Proof of that badge being there, it doesn't work. I block the transaction. I, and, and for anyone who's a computer science geek, this is like the, the capabilities framework concept of security models or like quite similar to the capabilities framework of computer, like of computer security. And like it, you get a bunch of really cool extra like security guarantees around operation while still being able to make very complicated systems and how they interact. And, and know that you're gonna like privilege ex escalation is like huge amount more difficult mm. and all this kind of stuff, which makes reasoning about complex systems easier because you're now going, this thing has to present this badge rather than this thing has this set of admin privileges. And I can now think of, okay, separate problem. How do I properly secure that badge so only the correct actors right. ever get access? Right. This is now, a, it's a solved thing in the context of this system. Right. Right. Now I, will, I can separately address the problem of make sure only the right entities can access that that privilege. Right. We we in in the radfi we sort of conservatively estimate like 500 million dollars worth of of hacks in in sort of the ethereum ecosystem but you're right if you start including some of these wider things where some of it is system design and some of it is is how the code has forced you to design the system like that you can you can start to go into the billions with mm -hmm. with things like bridge attacks it's kind of kind of crazy. So but I mean the those things we, we discreetly identify, and there's a couple more like that. But the, the biggest solve for this class of attack is yeah. just make more things easy to reason about. Right. right? Make more things easy to reason right. about. Make it so, what Matt was saying, the system you write on the whiteboard matches your script implementation. All the interfaces, those little places where you drew an arrow between two circles on your whiteboard, oh, 
that's a token being returned from here and directly passed to there. That's a bucket going in here. Right. It makes it so much easier to one, when your implementation matches the model in your head, obviously it's easy for you to conceptualize it, right. to have it in your head. Mm -hmm. And then your interface points are very obvious and you can now think about, okay, I see exactly how I can be interacted with. Let me think through the, the consequences of those. Right. So we haven't made it impossible to make difficult to right. reason about things, right. but we've made it the vast majority of use cases. You can build it how you think, and thus your, your initial hurdle of mapping from your mental model to how you had to implement it is just gone. Right. It's the same thing. So it's, 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 it's absolutely possible to build an application on Radix in which you can get hacked. Like we haven't solved the ability for people to get hacked. What we've done is created a bunch of really helpful guardrails for how you implement standard things, mm -hmm. made it much more intuitive to be able to reason about the system and created much more user context around how they interact, which means that they're not going to approve things that they wouldn't with it, that they could improve without mm -hmm. having any idea of on, on Ethereum. We haven't solved the like the third one, the business logic one. Right. Nothing could solve that, right? On any system where you say, well, there's something upstream, there's something I depend upon right. that's, I didn't write it. Right. And upstream in the transaction, like take an, an Oracle price manipulation right, right, right. attack as a classic case yeah. of this. I'm reliant on some Oracle. Right. Something before I was called could have caused that Oracle to change its price. Right. You need to think about that as right. the developer. That is where your security time should be spent. That's where your code audit should be right. spent. Mm -hmm. Not on all this, well, this crazy, what if you could, if I made sure the admin flow is correct? All that stuff makes your code audit very expensive and they're forced to spend their time in a place that you wish they really weren't spending the time because yeah. it was, I really want my model proved out. Right. Yet we're spending all our time and is it possible to have a privilege escalation or right. something like that? That's right. a really good point because we see a lot of things get hacked that were audited. Well, <laughs> what, this, this calls into the question the value of the audit. And it's right. like, I mean, audits can have value, but it's, it's limited in scope. Like, you're, you know, you're paying for a certain amount of time, basically, for them to look through your code. And if you've just obscured all of the problems that you're, they're trying to find, it limits the value of what they actually mean. So, so last question, does this, does this mean that, like, does this actually mean that more developers are going to come and build with Scripto? Like, is this, what, why, why are you so confident that that's, that's the case? I mean, for me, it's because this is what of what me what this would have made me build right. when I first looked at Solidity. Right. I had friends who were saying, "This is really cool. You're a developer. You should program some stuff here." I got an idea for a thing, and that's a, it's a good idea. And I go, "Oh, it does sound like a good idea." And then I'm like, "Okay, let me go check this out. I've programmed in 1.7 trillion languages before. I'm sure I can pick this up in no time." And by about hour three, I would. Nope, absolutely not. I am <laughs> ethically, I cannot engage with this and have people put money in. This is too wild. The people who are building stuff here with money, they are either have no idea how risky this is, or they're just absolutely insanely confident in a way where it's like, are you sure that you know what you yeah. don't know here? Because wow, I, as a responsible dev, I am way too terrified to engage with that. This is something I really love about the crypto community we've got, because we've got people in there who have like, we've got a couple of people in there. This is literally the first programming language they picked up. Right. So it's like, I love the fact that people love it because it has drastically lowered the bar to getting started. Right. But then we also have people in our community that are like, you know, 40 year vendor and they've started right. multiple companies, they've built right. financial systems right. and they just kind of like, okay, finally you guys have built something that's mature enough for me to build something real. So we have both ranges that spectrum in our community and both of them are right they provide both of those benefits right it's, it's this ability to service and i think it's critical with any system is both the the per, the, the newbie and the people who see the matrix mm -hmm. right and like if, if you <laughs> if you can do both then you have a system where you have a provable set of tools that it kind of has a, 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 almost an unbounded scope for for creativity right. um it, it's been such a pleasure speaking both of you about scripto and the radix engine uh, and thank you so much for listening.